Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the creation and the expansion of the railroads in the United States during the 19th century and how the rail system changed both the country in many ways, including geographically and economically. My guest for this conversation is Michael Hiltzik, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author who has covered business, technology, and public policy for the Los Angeles Times for the past three decades. He is the author of the book, Iron Empires, Robber Barons, Railroads, and the Making of Modern America. He joins us over Zoom. Michael Hiltzik, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thanks for having me on. I find the developments of the railroad in the 19th century to be a fascinating one, and one that in some ways parallels our own time. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, the, the, how, how the railroads changed the country in the 19th century, I, I feel in some ways, obviously in some very different ways, but in some ways reminds me of how the internet, internet companies, tech companies are changing uh, the country today. Do, do you see that parallel and did that play a, a role in why you decided to write this book now? Uh, it did play a role in why I decided to write the book, and it played a stronger role the the deeper I got into the subject. Uh, I think what you find, or what I find, is that it, in periods of great technological change, you you see you always see a lot of similarities. You see the pioneers uh, losing money, uh, uh, the pioneers uh, becoming lionized by the public for their achievements, and then gradually losing the esteem of the public as they go on, because uh, as they build their empires, so to speak, uh, their personal interests and corporate interests begin to take uh, uh, a much more important role in their activities than the public interests. What is meant, and I've heard this term, and, and I think, you know, intuitively I get a sense of probably what it means, but, but where does this term robber baron come from? Well, it was a term that was first applied to Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, in part because uh, his critics thought that, uh, uh, as is often the case, behind his great fortune, there was a crime. They couldn't necessarily put their fingers on the crime, but they thought that there was something unsavory about how he built his, uh, his fortune. And the fact is that he was essentially a monopolist. He was, uh, he was a ruthless businessman, a ruthless competitor. So there was something to be said for that notion. And then over time, as his, uh, his rivals and colleagues and successors came on the scene, the term began to be applied to all of them uh, pretty much universally. And, and this, certainly this dynamic would certainly begin before Cornelius Vanderbilt came onto the scene. Uh, that's that's true, although uh, given the importance that the railroad industry played in the development of the U.S., uh, especially um, even before the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, but certainly after that, uh, th this was r really a great example of, of the form, so to speak. When, 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 does, when, when does rail really begin and take off in this country? Well, starting as early as the 1840s or 1850s, there was a tremendous amount of railroad construction, mostly along the eastern seaboard and then the northeast, and the part of the country that that uh, went from the uh, the Atlantic toward Chicago. Um, you find, if you look at railroad maps of that period, that's before the Civil War, uh, you see a lot of buildup of uh, railroads in that region. Uh, and not very much beyond Chicago and really very little at all uh, beyond the Mississippi and out to the West Coast. Uh, with the beginning of the Civil War, it became clear to uh, Congress and the White House that uh, rail service really needed to be extended as far west as it could be, in part for logistical reasons, for military reasons, but also uh, political reasons because uh, a railroad to the West Coast was seen as one way to keep the, the furthest flung parts of the American empire bound to the Union, that is uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, they were very isolated. There was a lot of concern that uh, 
um, slavery would take hold, secession would be talked about uh, in, in uh, on the West Coast. The Union obviously didn't want that to happen. So uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, the first Transcontinental Railroad, that's the Union Central and the Central, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, met at Promontory Summit in Utah in May of 1869. And that really launched a, a period of uh, railroad construction from Chicago and the Mississippi all the way west. I, I was going to ask if this was just uh, about westward expansion and the development of the railroads. Did Was the development of the railroads in, in the 1840s the, I guess the beginning of this process at all a factor in the desire to acquire more land and to move westward? Of course, we have the Mexican-American War in, in the late 18, 1840s. Or, or is this something that just comes after the conquering or, or the winning of that war and conquering of that land? There were a lot of factors in um, uh, the, the stretching of, of uh, the United States west. Um, the gold rush, uh, which began in 1848, obviously, was a major factor. Uh, discovery of gold in California produced the, the largest migration of humanity west from the East Coast in the United States in American history. Um, the, the rigors of, of going west uh, really uh, made clear that uh, different forms of transportation would, would be beneficial. Uh, the, the 49ers or the Argonauts, as they're known in California, um, uh, got uh, went west, um, uh, many of them overland. It was obviously, it, it took weeks and weeks to reach the West Coast from, uh, from the East Coast overland. Um, many of them went south. Uh, they crossed um, uh, over Panama. That was, uh, uh, in, in ways, a, a shorter trip, but also a more dangerous one because a lot of those travelers fell ill from cholera and other tropical diseases uh, and never made it uh, to the West Coast. So uh, the, the, uh, at the same time, the travelers who were going overland reported back that they needed protection from Indian raids. Um, and uh, that put pressure on uh, the, the U.S. Army to do something. The U.S. Army created a, sort of a necklace of garrisons across the West, but to be supplied, they understood that it would be better if they had railroads to supply them than being supplied over land as well. So you had all these factors. Um, there was interest that goes back really to the 1830s and 1840s in bringing California into the Union, uh, and that led to the Mexican War. That was an effort in part to keep uh, British and, and Russian and Spanish uh, governments out of California and save it for uh, for the United States. So once again, you had all of these factors, and they all came together to make it much more sensible to build transcontinental railroads. And then the end of the Civil War really opened up that effort. That that's interesting. So so after the Mexican American War, there was concern about ceding California and Western states to to other nations. Other European nations. Yeah, there always had been. Uh, there was a lot of interest uh, from Great Britain in getting a foothold, uh, especially around San Francisco. Uh, there were traders from Russia who were coming down from Alaska and coming down the coast. Uh, the Spanish, uh, through their interest in Mexico, uh, had a great interest in holding on to, uh, uh, to Upper California, that is, um, uh, you know, from San Diego. Uh, north of the Oregon Territory. And you're speaking of Indian raids earlier. Uh, th this is an important aspect about the movement westward and the development of the railroads. I mean, there have been many books written about how the development of the railroads coming west would would uh, decimate indigenous populations throughout the, the, the Western world, the Western United States. Well, it was the, the, the general encroachment of white settlers into lands, and into basically Indian lands and Indian settlements. Uh, there were conflicts that occurred because uh, white settlers were taking over uh, uh, regions and territories that Indian tribes had relied on for hunting uh, and, and planting uh, and, and basically their livelihoods. 
and they reacted uh, uh, by basically taking whatever means they could to discourage um, white settlers from coming into their country. The introduction of your book, you lay out what a hellish experience it really was riding on the early railroads, the rail cars. Uh, that's right. It was it was a rough voyage. Even uh, I, I tell the story in, in my first chapter of a journey that was undertaken by Robert Louis Stevenson uh, in a, a year before he became famous as the author of Treasure Island and his other books. Uh, he was not a well man. Uh, he had to. Uh, he, he was in uh, cramped quarters on uh, railroads going uh, west to California. Uh, he was in with, with other immigrants. Uh, it was hot. Uh, he had to, because he was sick, he had to uh, sit by uh, an open doorway and keep prop it open with his feet just so that he, he could basically uh, survive. Um, and then uh, even after the, uh, uh, the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, even for uh, the, 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 the most well-heeled travelers, uh, it was not uh, always an easy trip. And I tell the story in a later chapter about the grand tour that J.P. Morgan and his family took uh, from uh, the East Coast to California, basically to see the territory and get a sense of this, this railroad, because the, the, the Mor House of Morgan were brokers for investors uh, in Europe, especially Great Britain, who were interested in investing in American railroads. So they understood that they better understand this industry uh, better than, than anybody else. So they sent young Pierpont Morgan West on the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific. Uh, and he, uh, he was in a, a palace car built by George Pullman all the way. So, so he was traveling in uh, the best conditions that one could find in 1869. It was still um, a, a trip of privation. The, uh, the railroads, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific were not built to uh, uh, really to very good quality because they had been in a race uh, that, to build as quickly as they could to get their hands on government subsidies. So they didn't really care about uh, everything being just just right. Uh, there were points at which the uh, the travelers would have to disembark as uh, rail cars were sort of towed over very rickety bridges uh, at points where uh, railroads were linking with one another. There were no schedules. Uh, there, you know, there was no coordination. So they would have to disembark and sometimes wait hours and hours to be picked up by the next rail line carrying them west. So it's not what we would consider very comfortable travel, although for them, this, this, this was unimaginably fast travel. Uh, this was a time when to go 25 miles an hour was uh, struck people as almost inhuman. Yeah, and this sort of gets back to the beginning of our conversation about how the railroads change society geographically, meaning that you can get anywhere geographically much quicker than any time previously, uh, and also made goods available that weren't available before. And in some ways, it's it's much faster now with the with the internet, but but in some ways comparable to to what the, how internet has changed society. This is how the railroads started to change society on a slower pace, but really much quicker than before. Uh, that's true. Uh, the railroads, uh, you know, especially as they stretch their way west, uh, they they both um, uh, provided a, a market for uh, for farmers and ranchers who had basically been confined to local markets up to that point. But they also uh, created uh, new industries and new developments. Uh, they opened up uh, the the heartland of of America to farming and ranching. This was, again, another encroachment into Indian territory. But the railroads, as they went west, it, it, it wasn't very profitable for them to cross wasteland uh, uh, and wilderness. So they played a role in, in essentially colonizing the interior of the United States. They would pay for, they would encourage and pay for 
immigrants to come west, uh, Easterners to come west to set themselves up in homesteads so that there would be goods to, there would be demand for goods to, uh, to provide for those settlers. And there would also be uh, goods for the settlers to grow to, to, to take the market uh, in the East and New England. And that's interesting. I mean, b- before we have the creation of, of the railroads, we have, you know, what, a, a, a good 70 years since the beginning of the United States. Do, 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 it's the railroads, you think, that make it possible for Americans to settle the West? Well, the railroads were, were, were certainly uh, a huge influence on colonization. And to this day, when you see um, uh, cities and metropolises that are populated by large uh, populations of Lutherans or Scandinavians or what have you, uh, the real reason for that is because the railroads had sent agents into Europe to encourage people in those countries to come to America and come into the heartland and settle the heartland and to take advantage of opportunities that they might not have had in their much more densely populated home communities. So, so how, what, what kind of examples would you see there today that you, you would see that population with, I guess, particular names suggesting that these were these people? Are well, uh, you, you know, you see Minnesota populated by Scandinavians, the Dakotas, populated by Scandinavians, uh, German Lutherans in, uh, in the Midwest. Um, uh, you see, uh, you see all of that. You see a lot of, uh, Irish American communities in, in the midsection. And that's because the railroads hired a lot of Irish immigrants to build themselves out. And then, and the promise was after they were done building the railroads, they would have an opportunity to take homesteads in this territory that they had helped cross. Interesting. And then coming to California, Transcontinental Railroad actually make it to Sacramento. Um, Was it just Chinese then at the time? Of course, we weren't given the same opportunities, I guess, at at settling. Well, now you're getting into the topic of my next book, (laughs) which is a history of California, and I'm going to be treating this. Um, uh, Chinese were brought in as laborers by the Central Pacific. That is the part of the Transcontinental Railroad that ran from California uh, east to into Utah. Um, at the time that railroad was being built, the uh, the big four, the, um, the the Sacramento merchants who were the main investors in the Central Pacific, discovered that they had a real labor crisis because there was a lot of demand for construction labor elsewhere in the country by the Union Pacific. Not a lot of opportunity to hire people. So uh, they had uh, the idea of bringing in Chinese laborers. Um, they could bring them in. They could pay them less. Uh, they were less troublesome in terms of labor relations. And they ended up bringing in really tens of thousands of these laborers to build the railroad. Then when the railroad was built, the Chinese laborers wanted to, to, to stay so they became farmers or they moved into San Francisco to uh, to work in small industries there. They, they played a big role in the cigar industry. And in that period of time, uh, after uh, the 1860s, that created a lot of conflicts, uh, certainly racial conflicts, uh, racial and economic conflicts, but, but really it was uh, racism at the core of it. And uh, that uh, that resulted in the enactment of Chinese Exclusion Acts, starting in California and really stretching to Washington, D.C., where it became national policy to limit the ability of Chinese natives uh, and and their their offspring to work wherever they they wanted in uh, in America. It was really a California issue. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Michael Hiltzik. He writes for the past three decades for the Los Angeles Times, and he is the author of the book that we are talking about, Iron Empires, Robber Barons, Railroads, and the Making of Modern America. Going back to the conditions and uh, the unfavorable conditions of the early railroads and how difficult it was to actually travel uh, on, on, on the trains, um, a lot of this, and I think this starts to get to the heart of your book, is because the rail companies 
were mostly concerned about the financialization of the industry. Uh, that's true. Certainly in the first decades uh, of, of the growth of this industry, there were many, uh, uh, many leaders of the industry who felt that the, the, the best way to make money in railroads was not by building railroads, but through railroad finance. They were traders of railroad stocks and bonds. Uh, the trading of railroad paper really was an, an easier and more direct way to turn profits, uh, though uh, obviously not as, uh, as honest as, as building railroads. But you ended up with a lot of these railroads, including the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, were backed by uh, what, what we would call today and was actually known then as watered stock. Uh, much more financing was floated to build them than was needed to build them. So you had a lot of excess capital floating around that ended up in the pockets of uh, railroad uh, railroad leaders, uh, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. Uh, the big four, uh, Crocker, Hopkins, um, uh, Collis, Huntington, uh, and Leland Stanford uh, were thought to have made a lot more money by siphoning off money that was supposed to be used to build these railroads. Now, as a result of that, uh, the, the railroads ended up uh, not built up uh, nearly as well as they should have been. And these were burdens that were placed on these railroads that lasted for decades and decades more. Uh, it took yet another generation of railroad leaders to fix all this by making further investments to repair uh, the gaps that had been left by their, their forebears. Is this all happening in New York City on, on, on Wall Street? Well, it happened uh, before it happened in New York City. It happened in uh, the city that was the previous center, financial center of the U.S., and that was Philadelphia. Um, and uh, Philadelphia's reign uh, at the top of uh, the American financial period, it peaked during the Civil War when Jay Cook helped to finance uh, the Union effort in the war. But then Cook, after the war, uh, uh, invested heavily in the Northern Pacific Railroad. This was another would-be uh, transcontinental railroad and lost his shirt. Uh, he went from being the most respected uh, and most honored American financier to, to being uh, basically bust. And when uh, Jay Cook and company closed its doors, the center of, uh, 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 of balance of the American financial system shifted up toward New York, and that's where it stayed, and that's where it really grew. Is this changing the economy is or is is what we're seeing in with, with the the rail industry and the financialization of it is this sort of a new phenomena that that we're seeing play out or is this something that already existed now it's applying to the railroads well it was an old phenomenon but uh uh it was on a very small scale uh one of the uh the pointers i i use in my book is to point out that um before uh before the Civil War, the largest enterprises in the United States, largest industrial enterprises, were textile mills in New England. Uh, the Pepperell Mills um, employed at its peak maybe uh, 20,000 workers. Um, the railroads, uh, by their nature, were much, much larger. Um, by 1880 or so, the Pennsylvania Railroad was employing 2 million workers. So you could see the growth. And that, that, that forced on American industry new methods of management, new methods of finance, because the old methods of financing sort of localized industries simply wouldn't work when you had uh, big companies, big enterprises that needed to coordinate within themselves and also with each other. So uh, that forced the creation of, of new business methods that, that we still see today. Uh, it was the birth of, uh, of uh, finance, corporate management, that's really lasted to the present day. In interesting. It would also help us get to a major economic crisis of, of 1873, be before the Great Depression of the 1930s, and you've written a book about that in the New Deal. Uh, it was the, the crisis of 1873 that was commonly referred to as the Great Depression? 
That, that's right. In that period, uh, panics, as they were known, uh, m- mostly known then, uh, were uh, fairly frequent. They would happen every 10 to 20 years. The panic of 1873, which uh, created an economic slump in this country that lasted really uh, to the end of that decade, uh, was caused by railroad finance. Uh, the railroads then were, uh, as, I, as I point out, they were America's first big business. They played the role then that uh, money center banks play today in terms of their size and influence uh, o- over the economy. Um, they were the source and the destination of tremendous flows of capital. Uh, as we've talked about, uh, uh, the, the, this was capital that was invested uh, not always very wisely. And when uh, one big railroad sneezed, the entire industry caught a fever and, and would bring down uh, the entire financial structure of the economy with it. So that's what happened in 1873. It happened again in 1893 with yet another railroad driven um, uh, panic. Uh, There was a crash that's sort of the centerpiece of my book that occurred in 1901 uh, and then a more crash in 1907. We kept having these things because of unwise and imprudent methods of finance really until the 1930s and and dramatic remaking of America's financial and and, uh, uh, regulatory structure. And that, again, is with the New Deal. But so so during this period of of these boom and bust cycles between 1873 and and the 1901 one that that plays a central role in your your book, are there no efforts of, of reform after after these occur? Well, there were modest efforts um, that were uh, more or less beside the point. Uh, In the 1880s, um, Congress uh, created the Interstate Commerce Commission, which uh, was designed to rationalize the railroad industry, which was fragmented and and overly competitive. 1890, of course, we got the Sherman Antitrust Act, which uh, really wasn't uh, very widely used until uh, the 1930s. Um, in, in the periods before that, what we typically saw when, when there was an economic slump that affected stock trading or uh, uh, capital formation, it would be left up to private capitalists to try to fix things. Um, that's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons that J.P. Morgan really emerged as a leader because he was very good and very forceful at bringing together various players in these economic crises and forcing them through his force of will to uh, to, to basically put up enough money to fix what was broken but it was uh, it was really private enterprise government it was simply not in government style in the, in that in that time frame to to really play a major regulatory role Along with this great wealth, and this is a common occurrence in, in U.S. history, comes great political power. I mean, this is also right around the time, I think, of the Supreme Court decision in 1886, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad Company, where where railroads and then corporations in general are, are, are getting protections from the 14th Amendment of, of the, to the Constitution that was meant for at the time, you know, when it was passed a couple decades previously for, for freed slaves. Uh, right. Well, this was uh, really one of the reasons that uh, the railroad industrialists went into something of an eclipse in terms of uh, their their public esteem. Uh, they got bigger and bigger. They were not shy about exercising political influence anywhere they were. Uh, their view was uh, what's good for us railroad magnates is good for the country. But uh, they were doing this at the expense of farmers and manufacturers. So you had all of a sudden you saw opposition uh, to the railroads coming from the Grange movement, uh, from industrialists. And, and eventually it would take time. But eventually the government stepped in and tried to, to regulate the industry. And as I said, 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was one run at that fence, though not a particularly successful one. Uh, 
the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, uh, was born as a regulator of the railroads, but because of the railroad's political power, it really emerged as uh, sort of a, a slave uh, to the railroads. And, and eventually even the railroads used the ICC to fix themselves, to uh, to end a period of really cutthroat uh, competition. And they used the ICC to sort of keep each other in line. Tell me about Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, this is somebody who had, who had come in, as we spoke earlier, about the, the you know, the, the bad conditions of, of the rail system. He came in actually trying to improve them. I, I guess he saw an opportunity. We can make these better. Uh, that's right. Well, Vanderbilt, uh, uh, as you or your listeners may know, really got a, made his first fortune in uh, the steamboat uh, business. He ran steamboats out of Hoboken, New Jersey, up the Hudson toward Albany, and he ran them out of New Jersey because New York State had given an irrevocable exclusive contract for steamboat traffic on the Hudson to Robert Fulton. Uh, so, uh, so basically, Vanderbilt got his start as a privateer competing with Fulton and dodging uh, the New York sheriffs wherever he could. Um, but he soon saw, as other steamboat operators did, that the future of transport uh, and transit along the Hudson between New York and Albany and then west to Buffalo and Chicago was not going to be over water. It was going to be over land, and that meant railroads. So Vanderbilt started investing around 1842. He was a monopolist. He was uh, ruthless, and he had a set of precepts for how to make money in railroads. And the precepts went from, number one, get rid of the guy who was stealing from your enterprise before you came in. Number two, spend what you needed to uh, within reasonable limits to make the railroad better. Uh, number three, pay a healthy dividend to yourself. And number four, pocket your profits. So uh, Vanderbilt saw early on that the way to make money and railroads was not to manipulate railroad paper, but actually to make the railroads more efficient. And that meant raising uh, their quality and then um, uh, monopolizing the goods and passenger traffic along their way. That must have sparked uh, some serious fights between the people <laughs> and how things were being done before. Well, uh, he had serious fights with his uh, competitors. He had serious fights with other railroads that were running along basically the same routes that he was running. But uh, he had, uh, by the time he was uh, in these fights, he had more capital than his rivals and certainly more determination. So he ended up uh, as the winner, at least the winner in most of these battles, not every battle. Uh, most of them. And he was not shy about using his money and political power to get his way from uh, state legislatures. Tell me about that. Well, uh, he had uh, a lot of fights uh, over uh, franchises that were being distributed uh, by older men in New York and legislators uh, in, in uh, New York State. And um, he, he didn't win all those battles, but uh, eventually, because of the sheer logic of having somebody at good at his job as Vanderbilt, uh, he ended up prevailing. He ended up with uh, most of the most important franchises, including the New York Central, in his hands, and he built on those. How do we go from Cornelius Vanderbilt to J.P. Morgan? Well, there were uh, any number of uh, characters uh, along the way. Uh, the most interesting were Jay Gould and his partner, Jim Fisk. Uh, Gould uh, was widely reviled as a manipulator by his compatriots in the market, but he was sort of the inside man. It was Jim Fisk, who was sort of the flamboyant uh, outside man, but they worked together. Uh, at one point, they tried to corner the gold market uh, based on what they thought was inside information about what President Grant was going to do to refund um, uh, the U.S., uh, basically the federal budget after the Civil War, uh, they didn't quite succeed in cornering gold, but they did succeed in making a profit uh, 
from their manipulations, while those who invested with them got uh, basically lost their shirts. Um, Gould ended up as a railroad tycoon in his own right, uh, basically by ruthless buying up of uh, smaller lines uh, from the East Coast uh, into the Midwest. Um, uh, so um, he ended up at one point, in fact, at two points, as owner of the Union Pacific, uh, which he then squeezed for everything it, wor- it was worth to put the money in his own pockets. Uh, his um, The damage he did to the Union Pacific eventually led to its ending up in the hands of E.H. Harriman, Edward Harriman, who uh, is the other major figure uh, in this in the story I tell. At any rate, um, toward uh, uh, the, 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 through through the last uh, quarter of the 19th century, you had this situation where the railroad industry in the United States was in a bad way. It was fragmented. It was over competitive. Uh, it was not at all un- unheard of for a railroad tycoon to build a railroad along a route that another railroad already occupied just for the purpose of being bought out. This was tremendously expensive. It was tremendously inefficient. The railroads knew that, but they couldn't help themselves from continuing it. So Morgan, who had an interest in in regularizing this industry for his investors, stepped in and he basically informed these railroad presidents that they better get their act straight or they were no longer going to have access to the capital markets in Europe. They would have no money. They would basically uh, end up going out of business because they were treating each other so ruthlessly and so illogically. So Morgan ends up essentially in in effective control of some of the biggest railroads of the time. He was able to put them together. He was able to force them to cooperate with one another rather than compete with one another. The, uh, the mantra that he used was a community of interest. It's better for all of us if we cooperate, if we divide up this market in a rational way, rather than trying to steal it from one another, we will all be better off. Eventually, he became one of the two most powerful men in the railroad industry. And the other being? The other was E.H. Harriman, who was one of the very few men who consistently beat Morgan at his at, uh, at, at its own at his own game, uh, and eventually, though his career in railroads was was shorter than Morgan's, he was as powerful, maybe more powerful than Morgan ever was in the railroad industry toward the end of the nineteenth century and into the first decade or two of the twentieth. This is a time when we have the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt and his attempt to break up the monopolies. How does, this, how does that play into this story? Well, uh, what happened was that uh, it, uh, in 1900, 1901, Morgan and Harriman found themselves in a battle for control of a railroad called the Northern Pacific. Uh, and they were in this battle because Morgan wanted the Northern Pacific because it had access to Chicago, which at that point was emerging as a hub. Harriman wanted it because at that time he owned the Union Pacific and he understood that if the Northern Pacific ended up in uh, Morgan's control, Morgan would be able really to uh, take advantage of the Union Pacific in in a, a million ways to the Union Pacific's disadvantage. So they were in this huge battle. They, they tried to outbid each other for the stock of the Northern Pacific. This created uh, a huge run up in Northern Pacific stock and eventually ended up in a massive crash on the New York Stock Exchange in the first week of May 1901 that took down the fortunes of thousands of small investors. Uh, Finally, Morgan and Harriman basically had to settle with one another to end this fight. And they settled it by creating the Northern Securities Trust. And the Northern Securities Trust, basically they put their interests together in a trust. Well, that became the first trust that Teddy Roosevelt, the trust buster, busted. Uh, Roosevelt had been an old friend of uh, E.H. Harriman, uh, mm-hmm. but they had broken apart basically for 
personal and political reasons and a very bitter split. And then uh, Roosevelt, who, who basically saw himself as a friend of the little guy and a friend of the small investor, went on the, on the, the stump. This was um, up to the point that he was running for election on his own terms. And after he was reelected as president, uh, he would give speeches talking about the malefactors of great wealth who were harming the American public. No one, he never mentioned Harriman by name, but he didn't have to because everybody understood that he was pointing his finger at E.H. Harriman. Uh, so uh, Roosevelt did what he could to break up the Northern Securities Trust. And eventually that effort succeeded, though uh, by that time, Roosevelt was was out of office. But the Supreme Court essentially agreed with him that the Northern Securities Trust was a, a trust in restraint of trade. It violated the Sherman Act, which at that point was 20 years old already. Uh, and the Supreme Court broke it up. So um, that's uh, that was Teddy Roosevelt's uh, role in all this. He he saw what was happening and he thought it was not going to be good for the country. Does the power of the rail companies wane? And and if so, is it is it of their own doing? Is it because of technology and the, and the proliferation of, of cars and air travel and, and other ways of transportation? Or what 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 would happen to sort of this period? Because clearly, this period of time we're talking about rail is king. Does it remain that way? And if not, why? So it doesn't remain that way forever. Um, it was a, a, a number of uh, factors that contributed to its ultimate decline. Um, the, uh, uh, the most important period for the construction of rail lines was in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. That's where you saw uh, the most mileage being added to the American system. The railroads became complacent. They didn't think they had much competition, uh, quality of the rolling stock declined, uh, quality of labor relations plummeted, uh, the quality of the rail, uh, of the, the tracks themselves declined. Uh, and that uh, really uh, became evident uh, in the mobilization in 1917 for World War I, when the US government basically took over the railroads because they needed uh, that the transportation capacity to move troops around the country and then off to Europe and discovered that uh, the rail industry was decrepit. So uh, there was a lot of pressure uh, to improve. But by the time that trend began, we began to see competition from other forms of transport, air transport, truck transport. Um, and uh, the, the railroads essentially lost their lost their way and then lost their ability to control how goods and passengers were moved about the country they took their eyes off the ball uh they didn't really understand the competition they were going to be facing and and as a result they went into a long-term decline which of course has continued to this day michael hiltzik you have been writing about business and technology for a long time now do you see their being lessons from this period of time that you write about in your book, Iron Empires, that we should be thinking about today and in, in looking at the, the, the tech industry? I, I think that uh, the, the lesson is that these things always go in cycles and that we should be wary of uh, business tycoons uh, who were lionized by the public as uh, people of great achievement uh, and watch out for the uh, for the point at which uh, they stop uh, serving the public interest and start serving their own interest uh, at the expense of the public. And 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 as I said, I think we have seen that vividly in uh, the public uh, attitude toward uh, tech uh, magnates of today. Whether we're talking about Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos. Uh, or, uh, or or Bill Gates, that uh, we uh, we have to watch out for the point at which uh, their businesses become um, uh, start to to damage 
uh, society rather than helping society. And I think that moment always comes when you have a new technology. Uh, at first, the technology looks as though, and it, and is a great boon uh, to uh, to society in many ways. Uh, the railroads, as we've said, bound the country together. They uh, shortened, uh, basically, they shortened time and they shortened uh, geography in ways that really uh, were great for the growth of the American economy, were great for social mobility uh, across the country. Uh, they were great for, uh, uh, for the emergence of women into society and, and into the economy. But then the point came when it was all about the railroad's interests and uh, they began to uh, essentially feed off uh, the rest of the public um, in the same way that farmers and manufacturers saw that they were essentially being cheated by railroads. I think we see now that the users of technology um, are, are being harmed by invasions of privacy and by uh, mono monopolistic habits of big industrial, uh, sorry, big technological companies, we can see the influence that they exercise over politics more often than not a negative influence rather than a positive influence. We have to guard against that all the time. We cannot take our eyes off the ball. Uh, we're beginning to see Zuckerbergs and Bezos's um, and, and others of their ilk being brought before Congress and uh, forced to explain themselves in ways that J.P. Morgan and E.H. Harriman and uh, uh, Collins Huntington and Leland Stanford were forced to appear, appear before Congress in the same way and, and forced to explain themselves, uh, explain their, their financial machinations, uh, their economic influence. Uh, this, I think, is, is healthy, but uh, this is probably not the last time that it's going to happen. In American history, yeah, I mean, there's a there was this whole struggle to to see the railroad as a utility back in the late 19th century, I guess, early 20th century, in order to regulate it, and and there are similar calls today as classifying internet and the internet companies as, as a utility, so that you can also regulate it. That's right. Um, uh, these companies uh, grow big; they begin to share uh, their interests with one another. Uh, and, and uh, yes, it, it gets to the point where they're very monopolistic and the only way to deal with a monopoly essentially is to turn it into a utility and regulate it very, very closely. Michael Hiltzik, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with the Los Angeles Times. He has joined us for a conversation on his book. It's called Iron Empires, Robber Barons, Railroads and the Making of Modern America. Michael Hiltzik, I found that fascinating, and I thank you for taking this time to talk to us today. Thanks. It was a great conversation, and I appreciate it.